Welcome back to Mirrors or Water. In the previous video, we were introduced to this project's title. It is the lyric Mirrors or Water from John Frusciante's song Time Runs Out. We were also left with a question. Why is John using an archetypal symbol in his music? The reason he's using this symbol is related to the comments he made during a 2004 Q&A that I clipped for the video Frusciante Talk Spirits. In that clip, John is talking about spirits and how they can convey ideas from other realms. Musicians, whether consciously or unconsciously, express these ideas through their music. What John is saying may seem strange, but he's actually describing the essence behind our reality. And in this video, I will explain how. If you lay out John's comments from the 2004 Q&A, you get something that looks like this. Ideas from other realms, spirits communicating the ideas, and John expressing these ideas either consciously or unconsciously. One way to look at this is through the lens of dreams. When you dream, you're essentially entering another realm, and in particularly powerful dreams, it may feel like the characters in the dream are conveying ideas to you. This was the plot to Disney's version of Alice in Wonderland. And how did the animators depict the transition between realms? Not by going down the rabbit hole. This moment is the demarcation point between the conscious and the unconscious world, introducing the viewer to Alice's imagination through the appearance of the white rabbit. And coincidentally, he's also concerned about time running out. As you can see, there is something about the animator's use of this symbol that seems appropriate. How reflecting on the water's surface is the perfect symbol for interacting with another realm. But how conscious were they of its meaning? Chances are they used the symbol because it felt right. Just like John either consciously or unconsciously expressing ideas from other realms into his music. The interaction between the conscious and the unconscious mind can produce amazing imagery. And to help with understanding this topic, we are going to look to the works of Carl Jung. Here is a quote where he uses water as a symbol of the unconscious. Water is the commonest symbol for the unconscious. The lake in the valley is the unconscious, which lies, as it were, underneath consciousness, so that is often referred to as the subconscious, usually with the pejorative connotation of an inferior consciousness. Water is the valley spirit, the water dragon of Tao, whose nature resembles water, a yang in the yin. Therefore, water means spirit that has become unconscious. Reading the works of Carl Jung can be a fascinating and life-changing experience. His work on the collective unconscious and the self has changed how people view the relationship between science and religion. A student of Sigmund Freud, Jung branched off Freud's atheistic model of the psyche to develop the concept of the collective unconscious. A concept that never really found a home, too scientific for religion and too mystical for science. Let's take a look at Jung's model of the human psyche and see how it relates to John's comments. Jung's model of the psyche is separated into three parts. The ego or conscious part of your psyche is what you experience with your five senses and allows you to have personal identity. The personal unconscious is made up of contents that have been conscious at one point but have been forgotten or repressed. And the deepest layer is the collective unconscious. It is an inherited universal part of the psyche that does not come from personal experience. Jung believes the contents of this layer are the building blocks of all of our stories, myths, and religions. They are universal patterns that he refers to as archetypes. In his book, Archetypes of the Collective Unconscious, Jung references several historical figures that have influenced his use of the term archetype. Plato's theory of forms used the term eidos as the perfect eternal prototype created by the divine mind and St. Augustine speaks of principal ideas which are themselves not formed but are contained in the divine understanding. Both of these examples describe the existence of patterns and ideas that originate from an unknowable divine source. Through the observations of his patients, 
Jung was able to infer the existence of this divine source by recognizing certain patterns and motifs in their dreams. He called this divine source the collective unconscious and borrowed the term archetype to describe its contents. You may have heard a few of them mentioned as character types in stories and movies. Tyler Durden in Fight Club, The Shadow, Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, Wise Old Man, Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, The Hero. But these characters are not the archetypes themselves. They are symbols, representations that are pointing towards archetypal patterns. And a similar thing happens in dreams. When we dream, we are presented with images that are symbolic, a combination of conscious and unconscious content. These symbolic images are directing your attention towards the true archetypes that exist outside of human consciousness. And I think that John's lyrics are pointing towards something very similar. Let's look back at the layout of John's comments from the Q&A and filter it through the language of Carl Jung and the collective unconscious. Other realms becomes the collective unconscious, spirits become archetypes, and conscious and unconscious expressions become symbols. If we see John's seemingly strange comments through the lens of the Jungian model, John is interacting with archetypes, and they are communicating ideas from the collective unconscious as symbols. But how do we know that Frashante is doing anything like this? The answer is in his lyrics. In 1906, Carl Jung sent a copy of his newly written Studies in Word Association to Sigmund Freud. This began a written correspondence that culminated in a 13-hour conversation during their first face-to-face -face meeting the following year. Freud considered Jung his protege and successor, the Joshua to my Moses, overjoyed to have found a friend who seemed to understand his ideas intimately. However, over their five-year relationship, major differences between their work slowly grew to a point where Freud ended their friendship in 1912. Jung saw Freud's theory of the unconscious as incomplete, with only accounting for the personal unconscious. Freud did not agree with Jung's concept of the collective unconscious and his writings about theology, calling it unscientific. Jung took the disapproval from Freud rather hard and was the catalyst for the years that followed. After his split from Freud, Jung started to self-experiment with his inner world. During this process, Jung would engage with the symbols and images in his imagination, a strategy to communicate with his subconscious. From 1913 to 1917, he documented the raw experiences he encountered in what would later become the Red Book. An incessant stream of fantasies had been released. I stood helpless before an alien world. Everything in it seemed difficult and incomprehensible. Jung called this technique active imagination and said this about the years he spent developing his technique. The years when I pursued the inner images were the most important time of my life. Everything else is to be derived from this. It began at that time, and the later details hardly matter anymore. My entire life consisted in elaborating what had burst forth from the unconscious and flooded me like an enigmatic stream and threatened to break me. That was the stuff and material for more than only one life. Everything later was merely the outer classification, scientific elaboration, and the integration into life. But the numinous beginnings which contained everything was then. Those of you who are familiar with Frusciante may be able to draw a parallel between Carl Jung's story and what happened to John during his departure from the Chili Peppers. John had difficulty adjusting to the fame following blood sugar sex magic and was falling into a deep drug problem. On top of that, he also experienced the death of his friend and old bass player Robert Hayes. A few weeks later, while on tour in Japan, he suddenly quit the band on May 7, 1992, and he spent the next six years in a state of psychosis caused, or at least enhanced, by heavy drug use. It was during these years that John experienced his own incessant stream of fantasies. and the years that followed, John learned how to channel these unconscious forces into his music. I believe Frusciante's solo albums are analogous to the Red Book. They are a symbolic account of the things he experienced throughout his life, but specifically those six years. In 2001, John released his first solo album since rejoining the Red Hot Chili Peppers, 
It was titled To Record Only Water for 10 Days. During an interview about the album, John was asked how that part of his life contributed to its creation. Would you have made such a richly emotional and spiritual album without the dark experiences of your recent past? No. To make the album without the experience in my life would be impossible. It is only because I've gone so deep inside myself and faced so many things that by nature I should be scared of. You know, being in a room and sitting there with a ghost, hearing their voice in your head and seeing them as clearly as I'm seeing you right now. John directly credits this part of his life with inspiring his first album. Even the name alludes to the process of turning unconscious or spiritual contents into musical recordings. And this album is where the symbol Mirrors or Water first appears in his lyrics. To record only water for 10 days was a therapeutic event for Frusciante, unloading years of pain and isolation into each song. But he also creatively captured the lessons he learned during that time. And I think Mirrors or Water is one of those ideas. The symbol can be found in most of his albums. You've heard the example in Time Runs Out. But the others are not as obvious. In the song Away and Anywhere, John sings the following. I do dream you. Allow me to believe you are the real me. I see you breathing underwater. Here, John sings of dreaming about someone. And it sounds like he wants them to be the real him. In the next line, he introduces an interesting image of someone breathing underwater. In this example, John is using one of his favorite tricks. He sometimes uses wordplay and riddles to alter or disguise the meaning of his lyrics. If you consider the possibility that he's describing a reflection on the water surface rather than someone breathing underwater, then we have to ask, was he intending this to be the symbol mirrors or water? Later in the song, he sings, If my own will is from me, how do I take another mirror? How do I drink the whole shore? In this part, John is confirming our previous suspicions by relating a mirror with water. The person he's dreaming about is his symbolic self, a reflection in the mirror of the water. And it sounds as if he's aspiring to become this reflection. This is an archetypal symbol and points to a psychological and spiritual process where a relationship with the symbolic self can initiate a process of maturation and personal growth. This symbolic process was captured perfectly in the movie Life of Pi. On its surface, the movie tells the story of a boy trapped on a lifeboat with a Bengal tiger. But the underlying story follows Pi during his lifelong search for God. During this search, there are parts of Pi's personality that he represses. And this repressed personality manifests itself as the tiger named Richard Parker. It was only through building a relationship with the tiger that Pi was able to survive. And it was this scene that Pi realized the connection between himself and Richard Parker. Richard Parker is looking at something in the water. Curious, Pi gets up to see what he's looking at. In the next frame, we return to Richard's perspective as he stares into the mirror of the water. You can clearly see his reflection, but at the same time you can see unconscious content swimming around. As we dive in, we are entering the unconscious symbolized by the deep water. It's filled with images from his life. Finally reaching the bottom, we see the sunken ship that Richard and Pi were aboard. Through the eyes of Richard Parker, Pi was able to realize the connection between the deepest parts of himself and his dual personality. Richard Parker and the reflection from away and anywhere are pointing towards the same thing. And that is something like a transcendent or symbolic self. This symbolic self is found all through Frusciante's lyrics and even on his album artwork. You don't have to dig deep into his discography to find an example. Here is the opening lyrics on to record only water for 10 days. You don't throw your life away going inside. You get to know who's watching you and who beside you resides in your body. I think this second personality can help us explain the angels that are found in some of Frusciante's album art. Angels are found in many religious traditions all over the world. In Abrahamic religions, the guardian angel is a type of angel that is assigned to protect and guide a particular person. And that is the role the symbolic self plays in Frusciante's music. In his book, Our Divine Double, Charles Stang investigates ancient texts that have participated in the traditions of a symbolic self. 
These traditions view the concept of self as more than an individual person, that there exists a transcendent counterpart to our lives. One of the traditions Stang discusses is that of the angel. Here is a clip of the author talking to John Verveke on his YouTube channel, explaining how the concept of angel can apply to the idea of a divine devil. Now, Corbin has a really interesting yeah. take on this because he's trying to marshal both the Neoplatonic, but especially the uh, Persian Islamic Persian tradition. Sufi. Persian Sufi. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and their heavy theorization of the angel yes, <laughs> towards yes, this. Yes. Um, so may, and, but he says this really interesting thing at one point. So, you know, usually you'd sort of think, oh, okay, the, if, if you're, if there's an angel, that would be that kind of double character, yes. right? That yes, sort yes, of like yep. yeah, secures you and guides yeah. you. What I mean by angel is actually angel names the ecstatic transformation of a self into its next um proximate yes. self yes. right so in yes. that case the angel is angel is both somehow like up there but also what the angel really is is names the function of a being's ecstasy and transformation so he says you can activate the angelic function of your being and maybe you can activate the angelic function of other beings. The angelic function is one more way to describe personal transformation through a seemingly imaginary process. To some people, this all may sound strange, but there are practical examples that everyone can relate to. In the same conversation as the previous clip, John Verveke shares research that provides a more scientific look at this idea. Now, let me give you a concrete example of that, because that might sound like this is weird. Human beings don't do this. OK, so this is the work of Hirschfeld and other people. You go in to a university where you get the best of the academics who are supposed to be the most rational and the responsive to argument and evidence. You give them compelling evidence and argument that they should start saving for their retirement right now. You let them make any objections. You, you do this until they all agree, I should start saving right now. You come back in six months to find that none of them have started saving reliably it's because of hyperbolic discount. Now you do the following. You get them to imagine their future self as a beloved family member that they love and have to take care of. Now you come back in six months and you have two findings. They've started saving. And secondly, and this is how it overlaps with the imaginal, the more they were able to vividly imagine that and enact that connection, the more they are saving. Okay. And, I, and I think, and this is what I was proposing to you, that that imaginal relation between the current self and the future self that affords aspiration, which is essentially, which is essential, I should say, to being rational in this extended sense we're talking about, I think it maps very well onto your notion of the divine double. Even though the subjects in the clip were only imagining their family members, the results were real. Through a seemingly irrational process of imaginary play, a tangible benefit resulted. At the end of the clip, you can hear John beautifully summarize this process as the imaginal relation between the current self and the future self that affords aspiration. The meaning of the word imaginal is different than imaginary. Where imaginary is usually used to describe something as being not real or non-existent, imaginal describes the use of mental images in a way that mediates, bridges, and integrates the abstract mental world and the concrete sensible world together. Imaginal relation is similar to Jung's active imagination. It is the act of interacting with the imaginal that precipitates transformation. And Jung's theory of the collective unconscious calls this type of transformation individuation. In his book, Archetypes in the Collective Unconscious, he uses a familiar symbol to describe this imaginal process. Whoever looks into the mirror of the water will see first of all his own face. Whoever goes to himself risks a confrontation with himself. The mirror does not flatter, it faithfully shows whatever looks into it, namely the face we never show to the world because we cover it with the persona, the mask of the actor. But the mirror lies behind the mask and shows the true face. The true face Jung is referring to is his concept of the shadow. Just like Richard Parker or Tyler Durden, the shadow represents the personal unconscious. 
the part of our personality that is repressed or forgotten. By integrating this aspect of your personality, you move towards psychic wholeness. The self is the archetype of psychic totality and is the union of conscious and the unconscious. It is the reflection in the mirror of the water, the divine double, the archetype of archetypes. Most, if not all, of John's lyrics are about his relationship with his divine double. This approach to songwriting culminated in his 2008 album, The Empyrean. Prashante wrote about the album on his website around the time of its release. The main character is a creative person who experiences the full spectrum of life's ups and downs. All dialogue takes place in his mind. The other character could accurately be called the creative force, which constantly creates and perpetuates existence. Frusciante's description of the other character sounds like he's describing God. The creative force which constantly creates and perpetuates existence. Which shouldn't be too much of a surprise, considering there are songs on the album titled God and Heaven. And the Empyrean is the name of the highest heaven where Dante visits God in his divine comedy. There is one last set of lyrics I want to highlight. In the song Central, Frusciante uses the symbol again but this time a little differently. Switch below with above all the way up to infinity. There isn't any water, however, he is describing the same image. Walking alongside myself, none of us listens very well. Now he's adding the image of a second self. And next, he culminates these images into the symbol of Christ. I'm dreaming of a time that is not near, as a man on a cross, I have no fear. This is the most striking similarity between Frusciante's creative force and Jung's self. In his book, Ion, Jung investigates the psychological symbolism of the Christian Bible, and he too sees the self as an image of God. The God image is immediately related to or identical with the self, and everything that happens to the God image has an effect on the self. Any uncertainty about the God image causes a profound uneasiness in the self, for which reason the question is generally ignored because of its painfulness, but that does not mean that it remains unasked in the unconscious. What is more, it is answered by views and beliefs like materialism, atheism, and similar substitutes, which spread like epidemics. In the Western world, the slow death of Christianity has left the modern person adrift in a sea of meaninglessness. I believe Frusciante was confronted with this loss of meaning after the success of Blood Sugar Sex Magic, and he spent the next six years of his life lost in his inner world. After that, he rebuilt his connection to the creative force through his music. If we read John's lyrics through this lens, a whole new world opens up. One where interacting with the creative force in an inspirational manner can reconnect us to the meaning in life.